Hi everyone, Sal here from Khan Academy. Welcome to our homeroom live stream. Very excited about the conversation we're about to have with Lester Holt. Uh, before we jump into that conversation, I will make a few of my uh, standard announcements. Uh, one, uh, just a reminder to folks that uh, Khan Academy is a not-for-profit. If you're in a position to do so, please think about making a donation. Uh, that can be done at khanacademy.org slash donate. I also want to give special thanks to uh, several organizations that stepped up over the last a couple of months when they saw that we were already running into deficit pre-COVID and that the deficit only grew as uh, we saw 300% of the traffic we normally see as all of the folks are, are leaning on us for uh, as we figure out distance learning together. A special thanks to Bank of America, Google.org, at t Fastly, Novartis, and the Amgen Family Foundation. Uh, Amgen Foundation, not the Family Foundation. I uh, also want to announce, uh, I announced this on a previous live stream, uh, that we're taking select versions of uh, this live stream and turning them into a podcast. So if you want to you know, watch, or maybe you shouldn't be watching. If you want to listen to this, maybe while you're in the car or some other place, uh, we're taking a, a subset of our conversations, uh, editing them a little bit for podcast and uh, making them available. So you can anywhere you uh, you can get your your podcast. Uh, hopefully, you'll see the homeroom with Sal uh, shortly. Uh, so with that, I'm really excited and honored uh, to introduce someone that you are probably already familiar with, someone who you've probably already seen in your home, uh, Lester Holt, anchor of the NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Uh, Lester, thanks so much for, for joining us. Happy to join you, Sal. And uh, yes, people watch me at home and, and it's basically from my home to their home these days. Yeah, I think there's something nice about that. You know, you, you, I know, you know, it's out above my pay grade, but you might want to continue this. Uh, it's very intimate in a nice way. Well, you know, they, it's, it's a lot more responsibility than I'm used to. Normally I go into a big studio and I don't think about cameras and sound and lighting and all that stuff. Now I do. And, uh, you know, now my big fear is tripping over a plug, which has been done uh, and uh, threatening our signal out of here. But, uh, you know, it's, it's the, I always tell people that as a, a international news organization, we're used to taking the broadcast on the road to far flung corners of the world in hospitable places. So in many ways, this wasn't a huge challenge for us, but uh, in a sustaining way to do our broadcast like this uh, has been uh, it's been interesting. and. I certainly miss the you know face to face collaboration with my colleagues. I, I can imagine. I mean, you're you're doing it at a much higher stakes. Before I even do this live stream, I, I go through my house yelling, "Get off a live stream! Get off a of Netflix! I'm about to get, get off a of Zoom, everybody!" <laughs> so I can have all, all the band. I have a dog uh, that occasionally pipes in, and then uh, last week I was watching my uh, grandsons and the one year old. I'm on the phone, he runs into my little makeshift studio, and of all the things he touches, it's the button that could knock me off the air. And I look on the screen and it says, do you really wish to disconnect? I'm like, no. <laughs> so it's, the, it's always something, everyone's going through it on some level. No, it, it, it's, it's really interesting. And so, so there, there's a bunch of stuff I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about. And I do wanna encourage anyone watching uh, on Facebook or YouTube, or social media generally, every now and then this shows up in other places I didn't expect, uh, put questions. And we have team members who are going to surface uh, the questions uh, for uh, Lester and myself, if it's relevant. Uh, and and maybe a good place to start, which I think is really exciting because we have a lot of young people watching this and a lot of parents who watch this, is uh, not only are you the anchor of the NBC Nightly News, you're also the anchor of the NBC Nightly News Kids Edition, which is available uh, online, if someone were to search that, look it up, which which I love. I've actually watched many, many episodes of it. Tell us why why you did this and what what this is. Well, this was early on in in the pandemic, and you know things were going south very quickly. We were all being overwhelmed, and I remember you know doing the newscast every night and thinking, you know, there are families watching this right now, and the numbers and the stories we're telling are grim, and these video diaries from these healthcare workers. And you know, one of the other uh, uh, producers on the broadcast said, you know, maybe we should do a, a kid's show geared toward them. And we all looked at each other like, of course, that's exactly what we should be doing. So it started out very organic, just a handful of folks kind of scrapping together uh, and trying to you know, learn as we go along about a way to present some of this very heavy stuff with this pandemic. Uh, to kids in a, in a digestible way. I mean, you know, kids aren't stupid. They're, they're watching what's going on around them. They're seeing the confusion and distress among the adults. And we wanted to, you know, do it in bite sizes. So we've kept that up and we've tried to also move along with the news. So, of course, we covered, you know, the uh, 
um, some of the protests and the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, things happening in space and, and other things that might be of interest, uh, of specific interest to kids. And we like to feature kids, too, some of the inspiring things that they're doing, how they have you know, figuring out ways to learn at home and just kind of adapt uh, to our reality. No, and I'll, I'll once again say it's really interesting. And I've actually been very impressed. You take questions from kids and the questions that they ask are oftentimes better than some of what you see in the you know the, the experts asking on uh, on the adult on 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 television generally uh, you, you know i think one of the really interesting things that a lot of folks wonder you know and i used to wonder this when i would see a lester holt on tv uh how did you become lester holt how do you how do you become kind of this trusted you know go-to person for a whole country or for the world you know, did you think you were going to do this when you were a teenager, when you were younger or, or what, you know, there's a question here from Nooper Mantha on YouTube, you know, what were your struggles you encountered? A lot of people think it's, you know, I wanted to do it and then it just happened all of a sudden. I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey. Um, things just unfolded for me. I did want to be in broadcasting from a very early age. I had an older brother, eight years older than me, who had a brief stint in radio. And, you know, he took me down to the radio station one day and I thought, this is very, very cool. And so that's what I, I really wanted to do was radio and be a DJ. Uh, at the age of 17, during my senior year in high school, I got a job at a uh, country and Western radio station in Sacramento, California midnight to six on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, you know, playing records and, and, you know, reading the news every hour. Uh, at the same time, I was got an internship. Um, wasn't even a real internship because I was still in high school, but I managed to kind of talk my way in to the NBC station in Sacramento, the TV station, KCRA, and kind of hung around there and helped out in the public affairs department and just tried to soak up as much as I could. Uh, started college, did two years into college and landed a job in San Francisco at an all news radio station. So I dropped out, never went back. Um, kids don't do what I do, don't do what I do, but uh, uh, it, you know, life kind of worked out, did radio, um, went to New York uh, when I was 22, maybe, no, yeah, about 22, and um, landed a job at the uh, CBS TV station here, then stayed with CBS, went to uh, Los Angeles and back to New York and Chicago. Uh, all in local news, and then uh, came to MSNBC in 2000, and it was the beginning of this incredible five-year period of news. I got there, um, it's just kind of back to the future, but uh, during the um, Biden, I'm sorry, during the uh, Gore-Bush presidential race, and of course the recount in Florida, and from that, uh, before long, we were, you know, staring at 9-11, the invasion of Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq, that was all in that really brief period of time. And I was principal anchor for a lot of that and then kind of worked my way across the river uh, to uh, NBC News and, uh, you know, weekend today, uh, weekend nightly news, uh, Dateline, and uh, finally five years ago landed uh, in this job. And, and what would you say, I mean, that's actually an incredible journey. I, I, the fact that you were, you're doing so much even from such a young age and you kind of knew this. I, I am curious, you know, what and this is this is sometimes hard for people to answer because they don't want to seem you know uh, uh, they want to be modest about it but, but please don't be modest what what do you think al you know allowed you to kind of stand out and eventually you know essentially have the the top job in broadcasting is at least from my vantage point you know i played the long game uh and i you know i just took it a step at a time and really never believed in you know, it could be this like overnight success without kind of paying your dues and a lot of people that I worked with talked about the importance of paying your dues, learning your craft, and just listening. Um, I was blessed with good mentors, um, you know, people who gave me sage advice and who admonish me, you know, when I got something wrong or the script didn't make any sense or, you know, whatever it was. And I just tried to give everything in, in each job and then opportunities would present themselves. You know, one a guy I worked for said, um, you've got to be ready when doors open because doors open at times you don't expect um, circumstances you don't expect, but you got to be ready to walk through them. That's kind of what my philosophy has always been. I've always said to people, um, you know, before I got this job, I was anchoring uh, three jobs at, at NBC News. And I said, sometimes we're so busy climbing the ladder that we fail to like stop and pause on a rung and kind of look out and enjoy the view. And, you know, I was in a place, um, you know, that wasn't necessarily the top of the game, but for me, I was really enjoying what I was doing. And so when the opportunity came to anchor a nightly news, I was prepared to walk through that door 
Um, but at the same time, I was, you know, I was perfectly happy doing what I was doing before. I love covering news. You know, I love, you know, taking my personal curiosity and making that uh, my profession. And uh, I just, you know, every every move has been, I've been tickled by it. It's been, hey, this is great. It's a new opportunity, a new chance. But I try to think of that, you know, if that's the last job I had, it's a great job. And, and what do you think, you know, when you look at other people, young people, especially who are coming through the ranks, maybe, you know, 20 or 30 years before, you know, a, a earlier version of yourself, wh where do you, do you sometimes look at people like, okay, that, 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 that youngin's going to make something out of themselves because of X, Y, and Z, and you know, that person's probably not doing it the right way. Yeah, I, I do see, you know, there's, I mean, when I, whenever I meet someone who says, I want to be an anchor, I'm like, you know, what you want to be is you want to be a reporter. Uh, another mentor I had said, you know, being a reporter is the highest calling of what we do. And I say that to say this, that when I'm sitting on that set every night, um, you know, yes, it's prestigious. It's the top of the game. You know, it pays more money and a lot of good things about it. But the most rewarding and interesting and fascinating moments of my career have not been sitting at an anchor desk. They've been out on the field with camera crews and a pen and pad and, you know, fighting deadlines and whatever hurricanes or, you know, toxic leaks, whatever the story is, it was just being there and covering the story. That's what we do. Um, I am always going to be a reporter first. Um, as I said, being an anchor, it's the big deal. It's a celebrated job. Very cool. I get my name on the wall and all that stuff. Um, but it's all about, it's all about the art of reporting. Do you still get to do uh, some of that reporting? Is that, you know, is that part of your deal that you'll, you'll be able to maybe do some travel or do some investigative uh, type reporting? I do. I um, One of the hallmarks of this show is we take it on the road a lot for, for big stories, be it a natural disaster or, or terrorists or attacks or you know, big, big stories. It's been difficult for us to do that uh, during the pandemic, you know, traveling and, you know, and quarantines and things have, you know, make things different. I did travel, though, um, you know, to, to uh, Minneapolis, um, you know, during the um, George Floyd story. We had traveled to Texas for the funeral there. So we've gotten out um, some, but, you know, we're, we're still making the adjustments. But, yeah, I still like to get out and tell stories. And, you know, I still work for, for Dateline. I'm sorry, I just hit the camera. Um, you know, I still do uh, uh, Dateline projects. I'm working on one right now. Um, so that's, that's what I love to do. And like all of us, we're kind of figuring out, you know, what's possible. How do we adjust, um, you know, uh, how we work uh, in this pandemic. But we're, we're figuring it out. And, and there's a there's an interesting question. It's, it's kind of related to that um, from Facebook, Ellen H. Ullman. Uh, and, you know, I, I guess the context for this is, you, you know, the news, when you watch the news, you learn about, you know, if, if, if God forbid a plane goes down or something bad happens or, you know, death counts from the pandemic, that tends to be oftentimes like the leading news. Um, you, you know, but the question from Ellen is, can we have some good news shows too? Wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, is, is there kind of a movement maybe to, to try to surface, you know, not just the seven really bad things that happen in the world, but maybe, you know, get people in a good mood. And I, and I say that actually, my mom, I think is addicted to the news and sometimes it, it gets to her. I think. No, I listen, I, I tell people all the time, they look at me, really? I say, you know, there are days that I do the newscasts and I walk out of the studio and I'm like, wow, that was tough. Like nobody lived in that, in that broadcast. Um, there are, you know, we can't obviously dictate. I mean, some days are just super heavy, but what we can do is try and have an arc of stories in the broadcast. And that's what we aim to do. So yes, there will be, you know, whatever the top story is, um, there may be, you know, then stories are dealing with a particular issue that's going on, but we always like to end the broadcast on something uplifting, some story, you know, we have, we have different franchises, Inspiring America is one of them. And stories where, you know, people are going above and beyond. They are taking on an issue by themselves. They are reaching out to their fellow man. It's, and, and we, you know, I've, I've had people stop me and, and ask about that. They go, I love those stories at the end. And sometimes I see you, you know, you tears in your eyes and yeah, that happens. I'm a big crier sometimes. Um, but I think it's really important that we find ways as often as we can. Again, we can't always dictate what the news day will bring, but find ways to kind of center people on, on the good that we all share that, um, you know, we hear so much about the divisiveness in this country and it is real. Um, but there's also, you know, just a lot of people who you know, aren't asking what your political stripes are and they just want to help and they just want to you know, make a difference in this world. And, and it's part of our job to recognize them. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And I mean, related to that, 
I mean, this is a really interesting question from Facebook. Faye Marie, how do you keep up with what's important yet not get overwhelmed by the volume of news out there? Um, okay, I'm just going to tell. Is it Faye? Is it the person? Faye. Okay, Faye. Sometimes I don't watch, um, and I say I couldn't say that. But there, I, I, you know, during the when we were first going through the beginning of this pandemic, you know, I would have friends, you know, say things like that. I can't handle it, and, and you start to worry about, you know, people seriously about people's ability to to deal with this. And I would say, sometimes you just got to walk away from it. You've, you've got to turn off. You have the TV, and and that's the last message I know you would want to hear from me. And I hope you'll watch me and then turn it off later. Uh, but what I mean by that, I don't mean to be flippant, but I think you do have to give yourself a breather, and 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 sometimes take it in in small doses. Um, you know, we've been through some some really difficult times you know, in the pandemic, um, the protests in the streets, you know, struggling, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, these are all important things that we're struggling with in different ways. You know, you've got the the politics firing at us right now. You need to be informed. You can't, you know, you can't, you can't totally unplug, but but take breaks. Give yourself a moment and try and digest these things. I, it's helpful to me. Um, believe it or not, there's sometimes, you know, during the day when I'm working, of course, I have to be plugged in. But there are some weekends where I have to say, you know, I'm going to take the morning off. Now I have my phone. If something big happens, you know, I can watch. I get the text alert still. I know what's going on in the news. But I, I do give myself breathers, and I think it, it can be healthy. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think, it, if anything, it can give you more perspective. If you have a breather, you can digest it and think about it more as a historian than someone, you know, just caught up in, in the moment. So it m makes a ton of sense. Uh, you know, there's another question, I think, from people hearing your, I think, pretty impressive narrative, especially in how much motivation and, and how kind of an agency you exercise when you were young. This is from YouTube. Wakina M says, you found your passion pretty early. What advice do you give for kids regarding passion and careers, what should they look for? How do they know? I think uh, I had several several passions. You know, music is one of my other passions. I'm a, I'm a bass player, and I used to play in a band. Uh, I say used to. We're not able to, to get together anymore. Um, but I, you know, I was blessed to you know be raised by you know two wonderful parents who who basically instilled this idea that we can do anything and that um, you don't have to take no for an answer and that you can live your dreams. And they were very supportive of me. And so I never I never really questioned whether I could do anything. And I don't say that from a point of arrogance, but it was a sense of if I apply myself, if this is really what I want to do, um, then I can do it. And then, you know, I would spend so much time studying. Uh, I wanted to be on the radio. So I would sit, this is, it sounds a little pathetic now, but as a you know, 15, 16 year old, I sit in my bedroom with, um, well, a record player, um, a tape recorder and a microphone and a newspaper. And I would play radio. <clears throat> I would um, I would talk up a record, you know, I'd give the weather. Sacramento weather is going to be high of 75 today at a low of 55. We got more coming up. But first, we got a song from whoever it was. And I would do the whole DJ thing. And then I would go, OK, let's take a news break right now. And I would give the headlines. Um, I would. This is terrible. I used to take uh, you know, unsanitary now, but I would take pencils and pens to put up my mouth and work on my diction. And then in high school, um, I got a chance to do the morning announcements every day. I was the guy uh, that would, you know, it was the quarter of a Lancer. So good morning, Lancers. It's 830. And here's what's happening. The Spanish club is meeting in room E2, you know, after school today. Uh, soccer has been canceled, whatever. I would do that whole thing. And then I would because I was in this whole DJ mode, I would try and do it like a real radio newscast. Um, and so it would always end, you know, and, and that's what's happening. It's 838 and you're up to date. And that was my, my <laughs> thing. So, you know, the more I tell well, the story, what did your the total nerd I was. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> what did your friends, did your friends give you, were, were your friends like, yeah, I know that guy. Or did they give you a hard time? Cause you, they thought, Hey, this guy's, you know, sounding like a real DJ. No, I think people got into it. I mean, at least they told me they got into it. I don't know. Maybe they were talking behind my back. But uh, but but it's, it's a long question. But the idea was, man, I, I this was what I wanted to do. And, and I knew I was going to have to, you know, figure it out. And so, you know, I got books and I listened and, you know, to, to radio stations. I would, um, I remember going down to Los Angeles, big market with my tape recorder and recording all the big radio stations there and then taking them back and studying them. Um, it was really, you know, how I kind of lived out this fashion. 
Wow. No, I think that's a huge takeaway for kids. I mean, any, anyone, any young person listening is just get deep in whatever you're trying to do. And uh, yeah, I guess if it doesn't resonate, you know, find something else. But yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's a wonderful people. A lot of people are asking about your bass playing. I mean, do you still play bass? And I mean, do you literally like show up at gigs and like on bass? It's Lester Holt, also anchor of the nightly news. Like, well, you know, this is, as I said, it was another passion. And so I wanted to, I, I uh, I was listening to a, a band and, I, and suddenly the bass stood out to me and I thought, I love that sound. And I, I decided I wanted to play bass. And once again, this, you know, Mr. Obsessive here, um, I saved up some money from, from delivering uh, papers and I went to a pawn shop in downtown Sacramento. I bought this you know, cheap bass and a couple of books and went on and taught myself the bass and started playing in the junior high um, you know, jazz band and jazz choir. And then I did that in high school. and. Uh, uh, part of college as well. So I play um, I play electric bass um, and I play the the big upright bass as well. Uh, I did Jay. I had a friend that used to do gigs here in Manhattan. He'd ask me to come sometimes and join him and you know s sit in on a set and back them up on bass. And sometimes it was very fun because they would announce the group you know during the break and they'd say and on bass you know Lester Holt. You could see people in the audience go, oh my God, that is him, you know, not expecting to see me there. And then a couple of years ago, we formed a band at NBC. Um, we call ourselves the Rough Cuts because most of the members are, are video editors from Dateline NBC, but we're all NBC folks. And uh, we would sneak out on, you know, Monday or Tuesday mornings, go to a studio in Midtown Manhattan and rehearse. And we would do, um, you know, gigs uh, here in town from time to time. And uh, we're we're all kind of in this depression because we obviously can't meet and play right now. But uh, I always say, you know, so so TV news is my passion right now. I always say it's important to have something else in your life, though, because I never want to be I never want this to define me that, oh, he is the anchor man. It's what I do. But I'm also the musician and there's other facets of my life. So I think it's it's healthy for all of us to discover something else in our lives so we're not pigeonholed in, in, in some other role necessarily. Not that I mind being the anchor. And what, what type of music do y'all play? Um, our band plays uh, mostly pop and rock covers. Um, funny thing is jazz is kind of my main thing, jazz and pop. So I was never a big rocker. So when I got together with this group, they started you know, throwing out these songs. And fortunately, I have a really good ear and I can pick things up pretty quickly. But a lot of them I'd never heard of. We're playing songs I never heard of. And I come home and tell my wife, said, yeah, we're doing this song, you know. And uh, I said, it's pretty good. She goes, yeah. Yeah, as as many discovered back in 1979 or whatever. Um, so I always say the group has kind of helped me embrace my inner rocker. Uh, but it's been it's been a lot a lot of fun. No, I could I could only imagine. So folks who are regular viewers know that I used to be in a band in high school, but I I, I suspect I was not as talented as, as as you are. I was the lead singer, and singing is a very generous term for what I did. <laughs> It, yeah, it's I, I not not it was it was heavy metal. Now I'm much more calm. I do more like you know folksy, acoustic type stuff. Uh, one question. There's a couple questions on this dimension, and and you know I'm curious because you know it seems like the media generally has evolved over the last several decades. Uh, you know, there's kind of the Walter Cronkite era back in the day. Um, what, do you see that it has evolved? Do you see that? You know, the media is kind of the fourth estate as, you know, kind of holding government accountable, making sure that our democracy is informed, you know, with the polarization and sometimes people kind of being able to pick and choose what they get. Where do you see the, the, where we are in that narrative for, for the role of media? Well, I think our role is still the same, obviously, to, you know, especially at, at, the, at the network level to kind of, you know, be the, the newscast of record every night to kind of tell you, you know, what's happening in the world and, and get you focused. At the same time, I recognize and understand our influence isn't what it was when, you know, I was a boy and, and watching the evening programs. Um, people have choices now. They have um, other distractions. They have other ways to get their news. Um, I recognize by the time they sit down with us, you know, at, at 630 uh, Eastern time, that they generally know the big stories of the day. They know there's something going on with uh, you know, with whether the post office can, can handle ballots and, and they, they know some you know, horrible new Corona numbers came out. Uh, as a friend of mine told me, he says, you know, I watch you not to get the news. He says, I watch you to get your take on the news. Um, my take being our take as a broadcast, you know, the stories that we choose to cover, how we cover them, the, the perspective we, you know, we try to offer and, and the, you know, to, to, 
to help people really understand the importance of these things. So on that level, um, you know, I think we're, we're still vital, but again, you know, it's not that idea of, of, you know, the whole world has to kind of stop at this time. That said, um, Many a TV writer has tried to write off the future of, of the network evening programs, but, the, but at the end of the day, there's still you know 20 million or plus people who are watching uh, every night, and I think you know we've all seen big increases in interest right now during this particular you know trying time in the country. You know people are craving facts and, and information. Um, you know we did take. Um, I mean, let's be honest, we did you know take a you know some some cheap shots from from on high about you know our business and the integrity of, of journalists journalism in this country but i think we have risen above that um i think that, that people recognize that uh you know they, they need these broadcasts to really you know deliver the facts and and to help understand and sort out you know really really noisy environment out there of, of information that's flying at you from all different directions some true some not no, absolutely. And I do think that the kind of the evening broadcast um, uh, news uh, uh, is kind of the still the go to if you know where you really can't sense the bias that you can in, in, in some other things that you can get um, either on cable or, or in, in the Internet generally. You know, just maybe one, one last question. Uh, you know, we're obviously in interesting times. You are it's your job to be the observer and the commentator on that for, for our country, for the world. You know, how are you thinking about the times we're in? What, what do you think uh, folks are going to say in 10 years about, about this time? Yeah, you know, I had the conversation just a few days ago. I said, you know, when the history of this pandemic is written, you know, they're going to spend a lot of time talking about, you know, how we managed to find even that a way to divide us over, you know, simple things like, you know, wearing a face covering, um, you know, maintaining the ability to, to maintain some physical distance between people. I wouldn't have thought those would be the, you know, the, those would be issues we'd be struggling, as, especially even with it you know, being tainted politically. I think that has, has surprised me, but it'll be part of the history of how this is written. I think, um, I think also we'll talk about um, misinformation and how dangerous um, it is, you know, to democracy in general, but certainly on an issue that is so, you know, life and death, and I say that without hyperbole. I mean, it is—it's uh, truly a life and death matter, and and facts matter, and words matter, and balance matter, um, and and so I think you know that's going to be you know part of how these times will be described. Um, I was maybe a little Pollyannish. I thought when um, when this pandemic broke out, I thought this would be one that um, we would see the country really come together, and we have on a large part. I don't want to uh, you know discount that, but. I think I, I didn't see this as being as divisive as it has turned out. Um, but, you know, it's part of the story. We'll continue to cover it. Um, you know, we, we as one of the franchises we do facts over fear. That's one of our guiding principles of how we cover uh, the pandemic and we will march forward. No, that, that's super helpful. Really good context. Well, well, Lester, thank you so much. Uh, once again, I'm self-conscious this whole time that I'm, I'm so homebrew compared to what you do. Uh, but this is a real treat and a real honor to, to be able to, to talk to you about you know the, all of these things. Well, Sam, I've been impressed by what you do for a very long time. And uh, I appreciate the interest. Always fun to come on and talk about what we do. We're, we're very proud of you know, our operation and, and love to show it off at folks. Great. No, thank you so much, Lester. All right. Cheers. Well, thanks everyone for joining again. Hopefully, you enjoyed that as much as as I as I did. Um, I am curious, you know, Lester didn't mention which pop songs he plays. I, I'm I, maybe I'll, I'll do some follow up. I'm I am curious, and there's it looks like there's some requests to, for people to hear me sing, maybe at some point. Uh, although I won't sing the songs I sang in high school, I'll I'll do something much more gentle. But um, hopefully, you enjoyed today's live stream, and I look forward to seeing y'all next week, uh, where we're we promise to have a whole bunch of uh, more interesting guests, just like what we saw this week. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend.